Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar, Paying to Save Money, Energy Efficiency, and the Clean Power Plan. My name is Cassandra Cubes, and I will be moderating today's webinar. First, I want to have a few words on some administrative issues. Everyone is on mute, uh, so if you have questions, please feel free to type them into your chat box throughout the presentation so that we uh, can get to them at the end and have a list of questions waiting at the end for our presenters. Also, this webinar is being recorded, and each of our um, registrants will receive a link to view that recording, along with a PDF of the slide deck within the next week or two of this presentation. So today's webinar is a part of a webinar series that we implemented a few months back, and the purpose of this series is to explore the opportunity for efficiency to be used in clean power plant compliance. Each webinar that we've held highlights ACCEE's latest research and emphasizes best practices in energy efficiency program and policy design. And also each of the presentations feature ACCEE's program staff um, and our staff from our clean power plant team. So um, we've had, this will be the fourth webinar in the series, and an upcoming topic, and actually our final webinar, will be held in July next month, and that topic is up to you to choose. And you can find a link to uh, vote on that topic in, listed here, and then I'll also have a slide at the end of the webinar um, that you can click to directly to both register and vote for the topic. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for that webinar as well. But today's webinar, Paying to Save Money, will focus on creative and emerging mechanisms for paying for energy efficiency programs and projects. By investing in efficiency projects, states and customers can reduce money spent on monthly bills along with a host of other benefits. And our speaker today will discuss how these financing mechanisms can be used in the context the state compliance planning for the Clean Power Plan. So here you can see our webinar speakers for today. First, we'll have Sarah Hayes, who's a Senior Manager for Air and Climate Policy and brings over 15 years of experience to ACEEE. She leads the organization's work on clean air and the environment, conducting analysis of national policies and proposed regulations and focuses on opportunities to use efficiency as a mechanism to reduce pollution. Sarah holds a BA in Environmental Studies from Lewis and Clark College and a JD from Fordham Law School. After Sarah, we're here, we'll hear from Brian Stickles, who is a research analyst focused on finance policy here at ACEEE. He assists with research and analysis for the economics and finance policy team and is currently focused on, on identifying and studying best practice approaches for financing energy efficiency improvements. Brian holds a Master of Arts in Economics from New York University and a BS in Economics and Business from Skidmore College. So now I will turn things over to Sarah to kick us off. Thanks, Cassandra. So um, for those of you who are attending, I think it, it maybe goes without saying why this is important, but I just wanted to start by framing a little bit um, why we picked this topic. Um, energy efficiency has always been a good deal and we have done, as have others, a whole bunch of uh, research and uh, analysis pointing to the large potential for cost-effective energy efficiency. As Cassandra said in the beginning, you pay an upfront cost, but um, for these investments ultimately you're actually saving money over the longer term. It's a real bargain. So uh, why isn't more of it happening? Well, if you work in this field, you're very aware that there are a lot of, um, well, a lot, yeah, of um, existing barriers to investment in energy efficiency. And one of the ones that we're trying to tackle or address today is upfront cost. Um, it's a major barrier. Um, as I said, efficiency can be cost effective, but you still have to have the money at the beginning to upgrade your facility or purchase the new technology or do with the building retrofit. Um, you, <laughs> there's a bunch of other barriers, market failures, outdated existing um, regulatory frameworks for utilities, um, a lack of understanding about how efficiency works and what its benefits are. 
but um, today we're focused primarily on upfront costs. And in particular, this web series takes some of the work that we have done in the past and in other contexts and tries to apply it to the clean power plan. So there's lots of ways to pay for efficiency, and uh, Brian is an expert in those. That's why we have him here today. And I, my contribution, um, at least I hope, will be to link some of that, those opportunities and those options to the Clean Power Plan. The Clean Power Plan creates an opportunity for more investment in energy efficiency because states are going to need to comply. They're looking at their different compliance options, and energy efficiency is among, if not the cheapest option for complying in, in many states. Next slide, please. So just uh, briefly what we'll cover, we're going to discuss some of the more prevalent options for paying for energy efficiency. For each one, we're going to give a high-level overview of how it works. Um, we're going to talk about how big the market is, provide an example of, of what it looks like, and then uh, I'll provide some thoughts on how it can be leveraged to aid in clean power plant compliance. Um, we are not covering all the options today. Um, many of these options could be used in combination or modified from the ways we're going to describe them, and we're happy to work with people to think through some of that. This is intended to be kind of a one-on-one educational discussion about some of the um, some of the approaches that you might consider. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start with the ones that fit very clearly into Clean Power Plan compliance. And uh, the first one I have is allowance allocation. So if a state opts to use a mass-based compliance plan in order to meet its Clean Power Plan target, that means it takes a cap and it has allowances, then how it decides to give out those allowances or, or put them into the market, uh, whatever method it uses could be an incentive to drive certain activities. So if a state had 100 allowances to give away and it said, we're going to give 50 of those uh, or make available 50 of those for energy efficiency investments, there is an incentive for new investment. It is um, the state doesn't need to generate income to make that happen because it's giving an allowance. But that allowance, if trading is allowed, will have a monetary value because the entities that need to comply will need to purchase those allowances. So there's a, a pretty straightforward way to create an incentive for investments in energy efficiency. The um, rule that came out from EPA contemplates some of that. Um, one of the solid options for doing this is being called by many updating output-based allocation. So if states decide that they are going to allocate those allowances based on energy gen generated or electric demand met, then it can, cre can create a level playing field for anybody, both clean energy, renewable, uh, efficiency, anybody who wants to participate can have an opportunity to earn allowances. Uh, another mechanism discussed in the um, rule that EPA released is a set-aside. So um, if the state said, we're going to take 10% of our allowances and put them into a special pool that can only be earned by energy efficiency um, investments, then you create an incentive that is, um, you know, nobody else can take those things. It, it allows efficiency um, kind of to compete against itself, but not have to compete against everybody else. And um, that's one way that the state can say, this is the direction we want to move in, we're setting our priorities, and this is one for us. Uh, next slide, please. Another way to leverage the Clean Power Plan compliance market is through auctions. So this is, again, states that opt for a mass-based compliance plan or a, a cap where there are um, tons of allowances available. They can auction their allowances. And they can decide either compliance entities can buy those, auction, those allowances and participate in the auction, or they could open it up and other people can come and buy uh, allowances. But that's how they get out into the market. And it creates a revenue stream for the state. 
and the state can use those revenues however it wants to within authority allowed in that state. So um, the great example that we have of this is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI, in the Northeast states. That is how they um, put most of their allowances into the market. And those revenue streams um, are used for a variety of different things that the states want to achieve that are priorities within those states. Um, but a lot of that money goes to funding energy efficiency projects. So not only are you getting the cap through the training program, but you're also reducing emissions even further by creating a revenue stream to invest in uh, energy efficiency. Um, in REGI, as far as I'm aware, most of the money that's given to um, pay for energy efficiency is, goes through um, public programs, so utilities or state programs. But I, I don't see any reason why that revenue could not be made available to the private sector as well. So if you're in a state where you really want to um, maximize private sector investment, I don't see why you couldn't have an option and make some of the revenue available to those actors as well. Um, another thought that we have been mulling over is um, why not a bid process? You know, the state could determine in advance how much of the revenues it's going to give to different um, actors or investors. It could also say, all right, we have this pot of revenues that we're going to spend on energy efficiency and kind of like a request for proposals. Come tell us, what can you provide and how much money do you need to provide it? And uh, they can select bids based on whatever criteria they decide. It could be the cheapest, it could be you know, a certain amount of bids need to be renewables and a certain amount of efficiency. That's totally up to the state, but um, that's something that uh, I think could be promising if states decided to explore it. Uh, next slide, please. So if a state does not go mass-based, the other alternative is a rate-based, where it complies by meeting a um, pounds per megawatt hour emission rate. And in that case, the um, unit that is used to demonstrate compliance is called an Emission Reduction Credit or an ERC. And the state can award ERCs. Um, it it kind of it has a lot of flexibility in how it decides to award those ERCs. So um, it can say, we're awarding ERCs to state programs and certain actors that provide programs. It can say, we'll award ERCs to anyone who meets these certain criteria. Um, the ERCs can be tradable, so just like allowances, they can have a financial value and a project developer that is a, or investor that is awarded an ERC can then sell or trade those ERCs for an uh, income stream um, or revenue stream. So I guess the one thing that really strikes me about what states could do in this case to, to um, make ERPs work is to make it simple and straightforward and streamlined. Um, I have heard a lot of discussion about um, ERC, the ERC process and, and, and frankly my sense is that people maybe are somewhat intimidated by addressing um, the different elements of um, meeting an ERC uh, criteria. You know, do we have to do evaluation, measurement, and verification? What kind of paperwork do we have to submit? Um, who do we submit it to? What is this process going to look like? Those questions need to be addressed. We might see some more guidance from EPA on how to address them, but largely this is up to states. And I guess I would say that a state that's going to go this route, if it can make this easy, if it can streamline this process, that is a point at which the state could help to ensure that investment in energy efficiency happens. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, where would we be without a slide on this? Um, utility ratepayer funding is one of the most prevalent ways that energy efficiency investments are paid for um, right now in this country. And the way that works is electric utilities pay for efficiency programs that they administer or that they pay a third party to administer um, via a charge on customer utility bills. So they charge customers and that money is directed to efficiency programs that benefit those customers. 
Typical programs include rebates, um, retrofits of residential and commercial buildings. It might be direct install measures where they show up to the building and put in new light bulbs or low flow shower heads, stuff like that. Um, they can really vary. This is not a complete list of the kinds of things that can be offered from utilities, but those are some of the common examples. Um, states in a clean power plan context, um, states can tie utility funded programs to specific savings goals, and they often do. Um, one, of the way, one of the terms for those policies is an EERS, or Energy Efficiency Resource Standard. So a state sets a savings goal for the utility and then tracks its progress through its programs to achieving that goal. Um, this, is, this is a good mechanism to make sure that you're getting the savings that you need for your clean power plan. It's also a good way to make sure that those savings are documented and quantified appropriately because most of these utility-run programs have requirements in place. You're spending customer dollars, and you have a regulator, a public utility commission, whose job it is to make sure that those customer dollars are spent well, and so they have processes in place, that evaluation, the measurement, and verification processes. So if you use that mechanism in your clean power plan, you're probably checking off the EM and V that you need, you're probably doing one of the better things you can do to ensure that you're actually going to achieve the goals that you put into the plan. Um, I'm not saying this should be the only approach. I'm just saying that this is one that is tried and true. We have a lot of experience in states, and it is very effective. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Now we're going to turn things over to Brian Stickles, and Brian and Sarah will be alternating um, on the slides from here on out. And before I turn things over to Brian, I'll just reiterate, if you have questions, and some of you have had questions, please feel free to type them directly into the chat box, and we will be sure to get to those at the end of our presentation. So take it away, Brian. Thank you, and uh, thanks everyone online for joining us me on my inaugural webinar for ACEEE. I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, it makes sense we're starting with uh, energy service contracts as um, they are the largest um, set of financing um, for energy efficiency. Uh, LVNL just came out with a paper and said that um, energy service contracts make up about 85% of all of the energy efficiency financing um, and it resulted in about $4 billion of investment um, last year. Um, the vast, vast majority of that being in the uh, municipalities, universities, school and hospital uh, mush sector, and uh, with a little bit um, in CNI. and i um, It should say, uh, energy service companies um, guarantee savings, and they either pay um, upfront costs or more typically um, help assist in finding financing to pay those upfront costs. Um, and when we say guarantee savings, um, they, they come in and they audit, uh, install, and maintain the equipment, um, and the savings guarantees come out so that they guarantee an amount of you know, kilowatt hours or energy units saved, um, and they price uh, that at a flat fee, um, which is less than, um, which ends up being less than your utility, your previous utility bill. So your new energy savings utility bill plus the fee that you pay to your energy service contractor um, is less than your old bill, which is why we call it a guaranteed savings amount. Uh, they guarantee it in that if you save in excess um, of the amount that you previously agreed on, uh, you get to keep those savings. Um, but if those uh, it doesn't perform up to expectations and you end up paying more, the ESCO basically just writes you a check. Um, so that is you know a way to lock in savings. And then after the the term is over um, for the uh, that you agree with the ESCO, you get to keep all the equipment that's yours and you get to get all those net savings um, just to you without having to pay that fee anymore, which is really nice. Um, typically, this, like I said, this is in the mush sector and they use uh, a financing mechanism called tax exempt municipal leases. Um, the lease structure is just, you know, basically what you pay usually for, you know, your rent if you rent an apartment. Um, it's uh, Typically, in this case, um, a non-ownership type of financing, um, and it's tax exempt because it's in the mush sector, uh, which provides you know better interest rates and better terms for the for the borrower. Um, and what's especially important about tax tax exempt municipal leases 
is that uh, the lender, not the uh, leasee, owns the equipment, um, and there's a non-appropriation clause, which means that the payments are not debt payments, but they're operating expenses, um, which can be um, very important in the mush sector. Um, and this is seen, you know, slightly less uptake in the commercial and industrial sector. It's about a $171 million uh, market there, um, mostly because this tactic of the municipal lease is, is just a really good way of financing these types of deals. Um, and uh, the CNI sector doesn't have the availability to do tax exempt municipal leases. Um, they previously used operating leases or capital leases, um, but FABI rules has kind of changed the, the rules on that, so it's, they're less likely to be inclined to do something like that. Um, coming as a result of those, uh, there's been a switch more towards energy service agreements and managed energy service agreements, which function similarly um, to ESCOs, except for instead of the ESCO is where you, they set a guaranteed savings amount um, and then price it from there. Uh, an ESA prices um, a unit of energy, and they call it instead of a megawatt, they call it a megawatt with an N. Um, so basically, uh, the amount of savings is guaranteed, but that megawatt is priced uh, less than you would pay your utility for you know an equivalent kilowatt hour. Um, so the, the you know that difference in pricing locks in savings. Um, and managed energy service is similar to that, except uh, the, the uh, financier or the ESCO agrees, or energy service provider and uh, energy service administrator um, agrees to pay the utility bill as well, which um, takes off the price risk, um, which basically talks about all energy service contracts. Uh, this is Sarah jumping in. So there's an example on the slide there um, of in Shreveport, Louisiana, there went as an energy service performance contract for 33 buildings. They delivered a whole bunch of energy savings and um, they took that contract and put it into the state's state implementation plan for achieving ozone standards. And uh, why I think that's a great example is because you know, we're looking at how do we we're considering how do we take these kind of arrangements, these private contracts, and put them into a um, state's clean power plan. We have an example of this having been done, and, I, and that's a great one. It hasn't been done a lot, but we know it can work, and EPA is very aware of this example. Um, the path to compliance thoughts here, and, and I just say a general word about this, we've kind of transitioned at this point in, this, in the conversation from um, ways to comply um, in, in, to create incentives um, to pay for energy efficiency and the utility ratepayer funding, we've transitioned now to financing. And one of the things that I think is pretty prevalent throughout all of the following slides is that these are not mandates, they're not guarantees uh, of a certain amount of energy savings. So. What Brian just talked about was that you can have an energy service contract that guarantees you savings. And that is absolutely true, and we have a lot of success with that. As far as what you put into your plan, you have to actually get those contracts in place. So as far as a path to compliance, you probably need some kind of complementary effort or policy to make sure those contracts happen. As Brian said, a lot of the contracts now happen in the mush sector, but I know that there are a number of ESCOs that stand ready, or um, the ESCO industry stands ready to expand their offerings in the commercial and industrial sector. And I know there are a number of folks working in that industry who feel like the clean power plan makes that a natural transition. Um, so ways that policy mechanisms that can be used to help ensure that happens is that states can strengthen their energy savings goals for public buildings. Um, I believe every single state has enabling legislation for municipal buildings to enter into these kinds of contracts, but not every state has an actual savings target. And that would drive more contracts um, for the municipal buildings. In the private sector, states can remove existing barriers. So Brian talked about a mechanism that's not available for CNI, um, but what kind of policies and mechanisms might be put in place to um, encourage CNI and also what might investment in CNI and what 
uh, barriers exist now. And that's going to be different for each state, but I think it's an important discussion to have if you want to pursue this as part of your clean power plan. Um, this is a good option for addressing evaluation, measurement, and verification because they track energy savings very carefully as part of these contracts. As Brian said, the ESCOs don't get paid unless they meet the commitments, the energy saving commitments in these contracts. So that means that it's being tracked and um, it would probably not be a big lift to take those quantified energy savings and put them into a um, compliance plan that meets EPA's, that, you know, that satisfies what EPA is looking for. Next slide, please. So uh, public-private partnerships are definitely, are usually considered um, in the vein for financing uh, to talk about like green banks. Um, but if you think about some of the loan loss reserves and interest rate buy-down programs that are being used, they kind of function in a similar way. And basically, uh, you know, a government entity can offset funds um, or set aside funds that offset risks for private, for, uh, private financiers. Um, and these typically result in better terms for the end user. Um, a great example is Michigan Saves use repurpose um, American uh, recovery reinvestment um, money um, to set aside a loan loss reserve for private financiers. So basically, they set aside funds on their balance sheet in case a private financier, uh, their loan that goes through um, Michigan Saves uh, has a default or non-payment, and they pay them out of that loan loss reserve. This kind of mitigates some of the risk for the private financier. And um, through a negotiation with Michigan State, they provide better interest rates for the end user. So um, with typical unsecured loans um, that don't have loan loss reserves, the interest rates can be high and really prohibitive. Um, people, you know, uh, if you're doing a home energy retrofit, you don't want to look at interest rates that are, you know, upwards of 10%. It's just untenable. Um, so these loan loss reserves uh, can bring those interest rates down and make it much more easy for uh, someone to finance uh, their own home energy retrofit. Um, and Michigan State does a residential as well as a commercial and a multifamily, so it can be used you know, uh, across sectors. Um, similar to getting these interest rates down, uh, Massachusetts Heat does an interest rate buy-down, and the way an interest rate buy-down works is basically um, they just buy the interest payments. So you're typically paying you know, a market rate of 5 or 6%, on a loan, like you know, like you would a mortgage, um, and uh, Mass Heat comes in and just you know buys that five or six percent that you pay monthly, um, and you actually end up paying zero percent. So the financier gets its um, you know uh, percentage rate that makes its cost of capital work, um, and the end user gets a low interest loan um, to do energy efficiency financing. Uh, and like I mentioned in the beginning, um, I. The typical way to structure public-private partnerships um, that's been you know talked about a lot, and it was actually the headline of uh, ACEEE's finance forum this year, um, is green banks. And uh, I think a prototypical example for green banks is the Connecticut Green Bank. Um, it's also the oldest of uh, the established green banks, and Connecticut is funded through um, uh, ratepayer funds, through repurposed um, ARA money, um, and through a, a number of different. Uh, public funding, but they engage heavily with the private market and have actually uh, gotten a five to one uh, public or private to public uh, ratio on the money that they secured. And they do things um, like loan loss reserves um, and things that are as complicated as, you know, making markets for new uh, technologies to exist. Um, so that's, you know, another instance of a public private partnership that uses, you know, public funds to make uh, private investment easier. And I, I would just add that um, I think these types of public-private partnerships are something that could work in both cities and states. So um, in, this is one where we have some examples of cities successfully doing this. It could also happen at the state level. Um, what I, and I think Brian made this point already. What I really like about these opportunities for clean power plant compliance is um, private sector investment, you're using some public money to fund the um, compliance with the air quality goals, but much more than that, you're using that money effectively to get 
other people to pay for your goals. And um, that is true of many of these financing options, but I feel like the public-private partnership is kind of the quintessential example of that. Um, some of these programs remove existing barriers, or these approaches, they remove existing barriers to investment, but they don't necessarily guarantee a specific amount of savings. People have to decide they're going to take advantage of them. There's no mandate to save a certain amount. So um, if you're going to go for one of these, you might want to couple it with an energy savings goal or something else to ensure that there is some amount of savings you can rely on in your uh, compliance plan. Next slide, please. And so we talk about, uh, a lot about you know, end use uh, stuff um, like loans, but bonds are also a really good way to secure funding. Um, it's a debt instrument um, that basically works for you know, large corporations or governments who basically can't go to a, you know, a bank and secure a you know, $150 million loan. That's just not something that's really tenable. Um, and so you end up you know, selling these little, little bonds to a number of private investors um, and you agree to uh, pay them you know, basically an interest rate over the lifetime of the bond issuance. And it's a good way to just raise funds um, for any uh, project that you want to do. Um, the two like, overarching types for municipal bonds are general obligation bonds and revenue bonds. Uh, general obligation bonds are just, um, you know, they basically kind of get paid hell or high water um, to back by the full faith and credit of the institution um, and are based on its credit rating. So, you know, when you see something that's like AAA rated, uh, that is um, indicative of the credit rating of that agency. Um, and then revenue bonds, <coughs> are used uh, primarily for infrastructure investments that are paid uh, um, by the revenue generated by the issuer. So they're used for um, you know, things like toll booths um, and different other different uh, infrastructure projects. And one of the more famous ones uh, that relates directly to our you know, energy efficiency green um, financing is DC Water just did a in 2014, a 100 year bond, which is uh, quite long for a bond. It was the first of its kind. Um, and it was certified green um, by the Climate Bonds Initiative um, to do uh, water work in DC. Um, and and, and uh, there's also, in a similar vein, uh, Hawaii did a green bond, um, not as long, but also certified green. Um, to fund its uh, state green bank, and NYSERDA did one a few years ago to um, fund a loan loss reserve, uh, a loan fund uh, as well. And the, the reason I like bonds for compliance is um, they're, they're a great way to bundle a bunch of projects. So um, if you need to do a series of efficiency projects to meet your compliance goal and, and it's hard for me to imagine a scenario where just one project would <laughs> meet anybody's 2030 goal. Um, a bond can be a nice way to um, fund that group of pro that bundle of projects. And also, because energy efficiency results in savings, it can be a revenue bond where um, you don't have to raise taxes to pay it back. Alternatively, you could do a bond focused on a single large project. Um, as I said, that's probably not going to by itself get you to compliance. Um, but it is a, a, could be a successful tool, and I just would note that um, green stadiums are an emerging trend happening all over the country. Um, the St. Louis Cardinals Bush Stadium, uh, for example, reduced energy use by 24% um, through uh, an energy upgrade. So linking these bonds to big projects like stadiums is something that could work. And if you Google it, there's a really interesting USA Today story about it. came out a couple of years ago. Uh, next slide. So Pays and Onbill are kind of energy efficiency, clean tech specific um, repayment types. Um, they solve specific pain points within the energy uh, financing world. Uh, specifically, you know, I talked earlier about unsecured loans having really high interest rates, uh, which can be prohibitive. Um, and it, those interest rates are high, not just because they need to be high, but because they represent a risk to financiers. Um, so PACE non bills solve kind of specific pain points with repayment. Um, pay, PACE is a repayment of the upfront costs via a tax assessment. Uh, the thinking there being that um, people pay their taxes. 
um, and they pay them at a high rate, uh, much more likely than they were to you know, repay a loan. Um, same thing with um, on-bill financing. Uh, on-bill financing is a repayment mechanism through your utility bill, and basically people also tend to pay their utility bills. Um, so the, uh, the way those two functions work, uh, PACE is basically, it's PACE is enabled in your state. Um, it allows the local government to either sell bonds or accept grants um, to fund PACE programs or to use private capital. Um, and state legislation can dictate the types of projects, properties, etc. cetera. Um, but with it, it's not technically a loan, but it functions a lot like a loan with um, you know, a set principal amount and interest rates. Um, and that's paid uh, via your tax assessment, so you know, to get paid along with um, all of your other taxes. And so it represents like a really good way to get your money back if you're lending money at space. Um, and they've seen some um, generally below market rate interest rates um, on some of these PACE projects. Um, and PACE operates both in the residential and the commercial space. Um, the residential space is a lot larger. It's about, uh, they've done about two billion total, and it's billion with a B, um, since its inception um, in the late 2000s. Um, doing almost 100,000 projects. Uh, this is uh, primarily in California. I think 95% of all the projects so far have been done there. Um, and they've had some issues with FH, FA rulings um, that this allows you know, um, some of the uh, parts of residential pace. Um, so that's still kind of a, a touchy, litigious subject, um, but it's, uh, not having an issue in California. And um, uh, other states are, are going into this well. Um, C Pace uh, uh, hasn't had a, as much um, origination. It's done about 750 billion, uh, sorry, 750 buildings, um, and uh, roughly 250 million invested. So not as large as residential pace, um, but certainly not insignificant. Um, a state approval is needed to create these special assessment uh, districts in order to enable pace, as I mentioned before. Um, so that's an important uh, thing for states to understand. Um, it's been uh, passed, this legislation has been passed in 32 states uh, plus the District of Columbia. Um, if you want to know um, anything about state-specific programs, uh, PACE Nation um, is the PACE advocate and they keep a lot of this data on hand. Um, they are just overall an excellent resource for anything you want to learn about PACE. You can see down there at the bottom of the source, uh, PACE Nation. Um, and those 32 states plus DC reaches over 80% of the U.S. population. Um, so, you know, it, it, it can reach a lot of different folks. Um, and while it is legislated in 32 states, um, really the majority is still coming from California for the residential programs, and a lot of the CPACE stuff is coming from um, California and Connecticut as well. Uh, the Connecticut Green Bank has actually stepped up and done a lot of CPACE work um, in their state, um, taking a real active lead. Um, so there's just a lot of, uh, you know, it's great, it's been passed along other places, but there's definitely still a lot of room uh, for improvement and a lot of room for scale as well. Um, the primary uh, California example is the California HERO program, um, which is uh, something worth looking into if you're interested in residential pace. Um, and the, the example that we use, uh, not a HERO project, but um, Prologis in San Francisco wanted to do an update of their office building. Um, they got an up. They got 1.4 million dollars in upfront capital via page financing. Um, they organized it via an ESCO. Um, they got a 20-year 7% interest, and were able to generate 100,000 dollars in the state each year, reduce their energy bill by 30%, and uh, have no increase in their operating expenses, which is hugely important for uh, commercial projects. And then for um, on bill, the on bill mechanism is, like I said, a repayment uh, via your utility bill. And so an on-bill can either be on-bill financing, which is uh, through the utility, and the utility uh, makes a loan to its end user, and that end user repays that loan via its utility bill. Um, because people pay their utility bills, and also because people fear um, you know, the shutoff of their power, these terms are much better. Um, that whole power shutoff uh, due to non-repayment of this loan um, is specific to the on-bill program that you create. Um, some have it, some don't. Um, either way, they found that um, the repayment is still very good, um, regardless of you, of you incorporate um, shutoff power or not. Um, Ondo repayment um, uses third-party capital, and it is administered by the utility. Um, so you know you can incorporate private finance there. 
Um, and it's the same mechanism you repay through your utility bill, and then the utility is um, on the hook for processing those payments, getting the money to the right people. Um, and there are two different, specific different uh, types of uh, programs. It's either a loan, which is a loan to the person or the company, and that person pays it back just like they would a loan, except it goes through the utility. And there's also the tariff program, um, where uh, the, the loan is attached to the meter, not the person. So it passes through ownership, um, and this is useful for um, you know tenant buildings where you want to pass on those payments, but you have you know tenants coming in, and coming out. Uh, they don't want to take you know a twenty thousand dollar loan if they're only going to live there a year. But um, if you want to make energy and very efficient improvement, that's a great way to do it. Um, and uh, on bills and contraction as well. Uh, most of the market is still in commercial and industrial. Now it's about a $76 million market in 2014, which is about half of the $80 million market. Um, and the rest is uh, dispersed uh, between uh, residential and um, public. Thanks, Brian. And I, I'm going to just probably sound a little bit like a broken record on this one because the, the issues for compliance are similar to some of the other financing options. Um, it's, a, it's a great potential way for energy efficiency, but probably needs to be coupled with a policy to drive demand and uh, something to ensure that energy savings are, are tracked in a way that will um, satisfy EPA. Next slide. Just a few quick concluding thoughts. Um, I, I think that we made this point throughout, but many of these options can be used alone or in combination with others, um, so think creatively. Um, some of these things will be embedded in the state's compliance plan, um, but some will not. So um, some of the ones we talked about at the beginning, the allocation methodology, the option, that would be part of the state's compliance plan. Um, but some of the things we talked about at the latter end, like the financing mechanisms, don't necessarily need to be um, included in the plan. They're more what I would um, describe as complementary measures. Next slide. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you to Brian as well for a great presentation. Here is a list of some additional resources that you can look to for more information on these topics. Specifically under the financing resources, I want to point out a report, an ACCAA report, um, uh, Energy Efficiency Finance and Market Reassessment. That gives a good overview of a lot of these topics. In addition, if there are other questions that you um, have been thinking about that we didn't address here today, we are going to be doing additional research on um, how financing and uh, clean power plan compliance can uh, you know, relate to one another. So if you have additional questions that you would like us to focus on, please feel free to reach out. I'll put up all of our uh, email addresses and contact information up on the last slide. So before we get into Q&A, and again, um, a lot of you have been typing in questions in the chat box, please feel free to do that right now. We'll get to Q&A in the next minute or so. I wanted to put out this information again for our next webinar. It will be the fifth and final webinar in our Energy Efficiency and Clean Power Plan webinar series. It's happening on July 28th. And again, this is your choice for the topic of this webinar. This is a direct link to both register for this webinar and to vote out of these three topics listed here that you would like us to focus on. So far, the CEIP has gotten a lot of uh, votes. So if you'd like to see one of these other topics instead of learning more about the CEIP, although that is definitely a hot topic at the moment, given the proposed rule that was just released by EPA, um, please feel free to vote early and vote often. We will close the voting probably in the next week or so. All right, so now we'll move on to questions. And as I said, if you think of anything or we don't get to your question, please feel free to reach out to any one of us directly, and we'd be happy to have a conversation with you that way. Um, so this first question that we have uh, is coming in, and I'll direct this to Sarah. Sarah, you had mentioned the um, allowance and ERC trading uh, markets that can be established under the Clean Power Plan. Can you please describe the existing markets for auctioning or, or trading that are currently in place? 
Well, um, I, I, I wonder if that question maybe got typed before I talked about Reggie, because that is one, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is one of the um, best examples of an existing market that we have right now. Um, that is an auction, and they have allowances, and the allowances um, are dispersed into the market through the auction, and then the entities that need to comply um, by submitting an amount of uh, allowances, either buy them through the auction or um, trade them uh, and purchase with each other or other people who have participated in that market. Um, in California, there is also a cap and trade market. Um, I would say we don't have, that I'm aware of, a perfect example of a rate-based trading program that's very active here in the U.S. Um, I think we have some things that are kind of one-offs, but this is probably going to be kind of a, um, a little bit of a learn as we go for the states that opt for a rate-based approach. Okay, great. Thank you. And the next question will be for Brian. Brian, why um, do all states not have enabling legislation for PACE like they do for ESPCs, or Energy Saving Performance Contracting? Sure, yeah. I mean, one thing is that PACE is still a relatively new uh, financial product. I think they attribute the uh, birth of PACE, I think, 2007, um, just go to Greece. Um, so that's part of it. Um, and the, the other part is that um, it requires state legislation. Um, and so uh, I think when Pace Nation goes through this, they say that you know, it, they really need like a local champion to really you know, take over, um, put this legislation through, and really you know, champion the effort. Um, and so if, no one, if people don't know about it, um, you know, that's part of the awareness problem, um, then there's, there's no way to champion it. Um, and um, it just it, it takes sometimes a long time to get the legislation through um, state governments. And I think Pace Nation also includes where um, there are, you know, partial legislation, fully uh, administered legislation, and fully running programs. And I think even in the 32 states that have existing legislation, there are only 16 uh, states that have actual active programs within them. So um, there's a lot of different um, small legislative hurdles. Great. Thank you. The next one I'll put to Sarah first, but uh, or Brian, feel free to chime in as well. Do you need specific EM&V or evaluation, measurement, and verification to claim savings from financing programs for rate or mass-based compliance? Um, what a great question. So um, in a rate-based compliance approach, the state is expected to submit as part of its compliance plan uh, an approach for evaluating, measuring, and verifying the energy savings that it claims in its plan. So it needs to um, document how it's going to quantify the energy savings and um, needs to do so in a way that satisfies EPA. There is a fairly detailed guidance document that came out with the final rule on evaluation, measurement, and verification. So if you're interested in more information about that, uh, I would take a look at that document. They accepted comments on that document, and what I've heard is they're going to be releasing a revised version sometime this year, so that's something to look for. In a math-based approach, the state complies by meeting the cap. So the short answer is there isn't necessarily an EMNV requirement um, for using energy efficiency to meet that cap. If you use efficiency and you reduce pollution, that's that, right? End of story. But um, I would say that if you're going to use one of these mechanisms we talked about where you allocate for energy efficiency some of your allowances or you do a set aside, you probably want some form of em &V because you want to know um, what you're getting. You want to know that you're giving those allowances to quality um, projects. You want to know that people are following through on what they said they were going to follow through on and, and achieving what they said they could achieve. Uh, so em &V is still important. Um, you don't have to necessarily meet EPA's requirements. Um, most states already have some form of em &V, so you might just stick with what you have. Um, the one other thing I would say is if you want to participate in the Early Action Program, the Clean Energy Incentive Program, 
um, we're still sorting out what might be required because in that program you get some allowances from EPA or there's the potential to get some allowances from EPA. And so even if you do a math-based program, EPA might impose some requirements on what you demonstrate in order for them to give you those own credits or allowances. Thanks, Sarah. Another question coming through for Brian. Um, Brian, you had mentioned um, green banks and talked about an example. What makes a green bank green? Sure. So um, uh, HEE is actually um, doing a paper on this of being led by Annie Gilliel on um, the policy team. And uh, it's kind of undetermined. Green banks and green bonds are both kind of in the, the wild west of uh, defining really what it is. Um, so the Connecticut Green Bank is a green bank that gives it time to clean tech and renewable energy. Um, the Hawaii Green Infrastructure Authority is technically similar to a green bank. Um, and then the, there are also places that have called themselves green banks that are essentially just you know giant revolving loan funds that don't really have anything that says that they're, what they're lending to is actually green or not. Um, so it, it, defining that is um, kind of uh, a difficult process. Um, the Green Energy Co uh, Green Bank Coalition um, has like some defining characteristics, and they have some uh, papers out on on what that is and how they define themselves. But um, for right now, and the paper that's coming out later, um, uh, they can define themselves in a lot of different ways. And there's definitely no you know like you are legally not a green bank or you are legally a green bank. Um, there's no real legislation there. And the same goes for green bonds. Um, someone can call uh, a green bond a green bond, and it has nothing to do with it. Um, so you know what those funds are supposed to be used for: uh, clean tech, um, clean energy uh, spending. And um, people are finding out that that's not always the case. Um, and so the uh, uh, bond initiative has you know legislation, not legislation, but a kind of um, determining characteristics of what a green bond is, and they you know, certify different bonds. Um, and that market is about you know, $40 billion a year, uh, according to them. Um, and then the financial markets have kind of their own. You know, uh, if you've been following the news, uh, places like Toyota and Apple have done their own uh, green bonds for some of the energy efficiency or clean energy improvements that they want to do within their corporations, and that's a corporate bond. Um, and some financing entities like BlackRock and J.P. Morgan have gone together and had their own uh, characteristics of what makes doesn't make a green bond. Um, but like I said, it's still kind of in the, in the wild west. You can call it something, and it, not, it doesn't necessarily mean it is something. <laughs> okay, very clear. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. And we will have to end it here. But as I said, um, please feel free to reach out to our speakers directly with their uh, email addresses listed here, and they'd be happy to talk to you further about any questions that you have or any interesting points that we should uh, we could maybe focus on in forthcoming research. And I'm going to give a big thank you again to both of our presenters, Sarah and Brian. Uh, a lot of information here, and um, hopefully this was helpful to you. And thank you for tuning into this webinar. Please feel free to reach out if you have um, any thoughts about our fifth and final webinar on the topics that you would like to see, and we hope to see you on the next webinar. Thanks again.